Hi Booktube. Last weekend when I when I reappeared on Booktube after a bit of a gap, I asked if it was still worth doing a best of 2022 video and the answer seemed to be yes. So here I am. I'm I'm going for it and trying to do it kind of quick and dirty. So there won't be loads of detail. I finished 172 books in 2022. So getting it down to, you know, a reasonable number to talk about in, in less than half an hour was a challenge, I have to say. I'm doing it in categories. I'll put timestamps so you can hop to another category if, if one category is stuff that doesn't interest you. Um, if you'd like to know more about something that I mentioned, because it's going to be fairly fast, ask in the comments and I'll I'll happily type something. And again, ooh, if you read one of the things that I enthuse about and you want to put some more detail about it, you know, feel free. Before I start my categories, how did I get on as a, as a scally dandler? Um, in 2022. Well, I checked and I read books by authors from 50 different countries in 2022. So I was quite happy with that. And around just under 40% of what I read was in translation. Not so successfully, only four of those 50 countries were uh, ones where I haven't read something by an author from that country before. And I need to do better than that in 2023 if I'm going to finish off my... Um, my project to to read something from every country in the world but we'll see we'll see how I get on first category let's go for poetry now one of the things that I read um or finished in um 2022 was Paradiso by Dante Alighieri um and I read the translation by Robin Kirkpatrick and so that was the the last part of um the Divine Comedy um, originally in Italian, of course, from 1320. Very special experience. Um, if you have any inclination at all to read the Divine Comedy, I strongly suggest that you use um, Tom of LA Books' um, series of videos to to help you through the whole thing, one canto at a time. And he's now doing it in Italian, having done it all in English. Um, the videoing, that is. Thank you, Tom. The next sort of oldest thing I read in my in my poetry top five. Oh, I should say I've read 14 works of poetry and this is this, this is the top five of those 14. Um, that's 14, you know, full collections or longer works as opposed to individual poems. And and but the, the shortest was Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti from 1862. I read that as part of um, October. Lovely, lovely poem, really um quite satisfyingly odd in a way quite sensual um and drawing on kind of folklore and ideas of of well goblins in fact yeah a goodie and sort of a a, a a long poem but not but not book length unlike say the ring in the book which i also read um another victorian longer poem the other three in my top five poems out of my 14, um, or works of poetry rather, is, is um, are all, as it happens, published in 2021. But one of them is also kind of a translation of an older poetry poem. So that's The Owl and the Nightingale. And I read um, the version by Simon Armitage, which was brilliant and really appealed to my sense of humour. It's quite a funny poem, but it was originally written in Middle English by an anonymous poet in the 12th or 13th century. And it's Armitage's version is kind of like a um, a slightly loose translation that um, uh, it makes it very accessible and enjoyable. Same as he's done with things like Gawain and the Green Knight, for example. The other two collections were genuinely sort of modern you know, contemporary collections of poetry, um, both by men, as it happens. Um, one was Pandemonium by Andrew Macmillan. Really, mm, Andrew Macmillan is a, is a superb contemporary poet. And it, this collection was in some ways quite tough because it's on the subject of mental health, very honest and revealing, um, but beautifully written. The other of my, my top five is All the Names Given by Raymond Antipas. Now, Antipas is interesting because he's a, a deaf poet, and but his enjoyment of language 
is tremendous. And I think, isn't that interesting, you know, how you could um, produce poetry that is gorgeous to read and he performs it out loud. I saw him perform some poems from his collection this summer, um, although kind of not hearing it himself. Fascinating and um, really uh, have a, he has quite a lot to say about being sort of black and British too, I guess. Now then, next category I'm going to do is um, plays. Now, I only read nine plays this year, not so many as I have in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm going to pick a top three of those nine. And probably the best play I read this year was um, Midsummer Night's Dream, which was also, in fact, a reread. And there's, there's not a lot of point in saying Shakespeare's brilliant. You don't need me to tell you Shakespeare's plays are brilliant, do you? And, and Midsummer Night's Dream is one of the most enjoyable. So we'll leave that one slightly to one side. And instead, I'm going to talk about the other two. Now, Peeling is a play from 2012 by um, uh, Kate O'Reilly. And I read it with Tilly um, in um, uh, as part of our Discussing Drama series. And Kate O'Reilly is a, um, a, a kind of disabled activist as well as being a playwright. And this play, it, what it does is it's... Um, it uses the um, almost that um, convention of the play within the play because the three characters that, that we see as our play are three disabled actresses who are like the chorus in another play but the play that we see is their, is their chat and them come and going in and out of role in the, the play that is happening else, elsewhere. Um, I love it when people mess around with drama like that. Um, like, um, or oh, another play I read this year, Six Characters in Search of an Author, you know, Pirandello. That, yeah, playing games with drama is always fun. And of course, Shakespeare does it in A Midsummer Night's Dream too. And it was that's also a feature, interestingly, of my other top three play of the year, which was um, The Grain Store by Natalia Vorozbit, um, translated by Sasha Dugdale. Ukrainian play and it's about the um, great famine in Ukraine in um, the 1930s. Um, they call it the Holodomor. Um, it, it was a man-made famine, you know, created basically by Stalin. Um, deeply just sort of scarred Ukrainian society and is um, not irrelevant to what is happening in Ukraine today. Um, and but again, this is this is a play that uses sort of plays within the play to um, uh, create the drama because you get these sort of um, agit, agit prop theatre sort of um, activists coming round to the village to um, kind of convert them, I suppose, you know, make them embrace um, sort of communism um, through performances. Uh, yeah, a goodie. Interesting. Graphic novels. Well, graphic fiction and non-fiction. I made an effort to read more of that this year and I read 13 different um, kind of graphic works, as it were. So I'm going to give you top five. No, top four of those. Top four because um, of those 13. And um, I'm going to, I think I'll do those in, in, in order of publication. OK, so The Arrival by Sean Tan is a wordless graphic novel about migration and gentle but profound and touching. And I love the artwork in it, too. That one was from 2007. From 2008, I read um, Britain and Brilightly by Hannah Berry. Very different. A kind of that has a kind of like a film noir um, feeling. You know, it's about a sort of a, um, a private detective, but it's got a kind of slightly almost magical quality as well, and really strong um, graphic art. Uh, and she's a, a a local, you know, Brighton author. So it was, yeah. Great to read that. Um, next up is one from 2017, 
the best we could do by T. Bui. Now, she's a uh, American of Vietnamese origin and it's a, a graphic memoir and it's about her, about her family having to flee um, Vietnam in the 1970s and then the sort of generational tension between the her sort of her parents generation and um, her generation who um, grew, grow up grew, growing up in the States and the sort of their under, trying, how, how they understand each other and how she tries to understand her family history and how it shaped her parents and shaped her brilliant but my most up-to-date bit of graphic fiction um was completely different again because it, it's much more in the sort of um uh, fantasy sci-fi dystopian sort of end of um uh comics and that was Jenu the omnibus edition and <laughs> that's by Butcher's very own um Tomaso Tedesco or um Tom L.A. Books, as, as we know him here, with a group of, of collaborators, um, Alex Frankelli, Giulio um, Strabic Tomasi, and some, some, some others. Um, very fresh, very full of ideas and um, uh, stimulating for me and not, not in my usual kind of, you know, I tend to read things like graphic memoirs and, and so on. And this was different for me, but really... Um, stimulating and special because it was you know it's tom's tom's labor of love so what have we done we've done three we're doing well we've done three um three categories category number four is non-fiction and i read 22 works of non-fiction um in the year and i'm gonna give you a top a top five of those three of them are memoirs of a sort um one of those is um, Ghost in the Throat that I talked about um, in last week's video because it's a, a relatively recent read for me. It's by Doreen Negrifa. It's partly memoir, partly translation, poetry, criticism, literary history, real interesting mixture. But the, what I particularly enjoyed about it, I think, is you don't often get books by by women talking about the sort of the day-to-day -day experience of having babies and you know doing making lists doing housework you how your life sort of shrinks into this sort of weird little world but she she was doing that and at the same time exploring the um poetry of the Irish woman poet um Aileen Dove and the juxtaposition of those two things was just spot on for me. Another odd mixture of memoir and I, it almost hard to describe is um, uh, Happening by Annie Erno, um, translated by Tanya Leslie. Again, that was one that I talked about in the video last week, so I won't say too much about it, but it, it's about her looking back, her now or well in 2000 when she wrote it looking back at her 23 year old self and the experience of falling pregnant and having to um deal with the fact that abortion was illegal but that was what she wanted to do um and sort of seeking that out and the trauma that that brought for her and the, how that's resonated through her life um now the other memoir i read was completely different much more conventional in style and not a kind of great literary work in a way like like the two i've just described but it was um so interesting and i think valuable in its content that it's up there in my in my um in my top five and that's uncomfortable labels um my life as a gay autistic trans woman by laura kate dale um came out in ooh, i think it's 2019 so relatively new it's it, yeah she does what it says on the tin you know it's a memoir which talks about her growing up um with that sort of set of um identities i suppose what that meant for her and for her family and 
she's obviously motivated by trying to um, share that to help perhaps uh, the next generation of, um, you know, autistic, gay, trans um, young people. And thank you. Thank you to her for that. My other two non-fiction choices are not memoirs, completely different. They're both kind of nature-y writing-ish, which is a first kind of a form of non-fiction I really enjoy. But um, one is, at the same time, almost fiction. So that is Rachel Carson's um, Under the Sea Wind, which which was her first book, came out in 1941. She, she's better known for later ones. And she almost writes, she kind of writes the story of four different um, sea creatures, um, kind of giving them not characters because she 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 doesn't sort of it, she tries to help us understand their life and their lifestyle and their position in the um environment and 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 sort of ecosystem but by kind of following an individual's life um yeah beautiful book and the other was um Mams of the Mind uh, which was a book by Robert McFarlane came out in 2004 I love Robert McFarlane. I hadn't chosen to read this one of his books because I wasn't sure that I'd be that interested in a book about mountains and mountaineering. How wrong I was. Uh, honestly, uh, McFarlane is such a brilliant writer. He brings in so many different ideas and um, draws on literature and history and philosophy and um, as well as, you know, geography and and just, yeah puts together something that is superlative that's what I think so well we're more than halfway through in time and I said I've got to speed up a bit if I can but I need to talk about fiction now now first thing I'm going to say is I did some rereading this year which is isn't something that I usually do and it's sort of creeping up in in in, in my reading I think I only reread nine things but you know some years I wouldn't read a single book, so I'm just going to talk about my top three reread no reread novels briefly. The Mayor of Casterbridge, Thomas Hardy, um, 1886, uh, a Victober read. I think why this is in my sort of best of for the year was the the enjoyment of the group read that we did of this book um, and rediscovering something that I'd read so long ago. Another reread that was from my the same sort of I was around the same sort of age when I read it but was a more recent book um was In This House of Breed by Rumor Godden she published that in 1969 I you know read it in my teens it's a nun book and and prompted me to do um uh top my top books about about nuns and convents which um you can go back and look at if you like but it, it was one of those things where it was just a joy to find that I it was as lovely as 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 it had been, as rich, as thoughtful. I find it interesting reading books about faith and religion, um, or where that's a key part of the of the, the book, even though it's not something, you know, I'm in completely not a believer. I'm a, you know, a totally secular person. But it's a really interesting part of human experience, isn't it? My other reread that kind of got into my into my best best of the year was um the passion according to gh by clarice lispector um translated by idra novi and that's from 1964 now i read two clarice lispector books this year the other was um an apprenticeship but 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 and that was new to me and that was also a five-star read but this just reminded me that the passion according to gh is is i think my my favorite of her books at the moment she's certainly one of my favorite writers well now, let's move along to um, novels I read for the first time. And I'm going to give you classic novels, top five, before 19, so written before 1950, a backlist, so 20th century between 1950 and 1999, uh, recent fiction in translation and recent fiction written in English. Let's go for it. Classic novels. Oh, now, I read Don Quixote. Yay! 
Hey, I was so pleased to actually read that book. Read it with a lovely group, which really carried me through. Um, you know, it was published in 1605 and 1615, the two parts. It's Spanish. Obviously, I read um, uh, Edith Grossman's um, translation of, of Cervantes. Um, good translation. It's often referred to as the first modern novel. Um, it was much funnier and more accessible than I anticipated. And yeah, if you ever wondered about reading it, go for it. The full title of Don Quixote is The Ingenious, um, the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. Now, when I tell you that the next oldest classic that I read is The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, you will guess that um, Lawrence Stern, who wrote that in 1767, was very influenced by Don Quixote. And it, it, Stern actually kind of introduces the, um, the, 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 the adjective quixotic into the English language because he, he refers back. So there was a definite connection between the two books. Tristram Shandy is a challenge to read in some ways. It's very digressive. It's it's like sort of um, almost someone you know telling you a load of stories, um, chatting in your ear. But I, I I enjoyed it a lot. The next one I'm, I've I've picked as 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 a top classic is another quite long book, but much more recent. And but another of those books that I'd meant to read for years, and that's The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. Um, it was published in 1924. I read the translation by Helen Lowe Porter. Who would have thought that a book about a bunch of people in a TB sanatorium in the Alps could be so engaging and entertaining and ultimately moving? Yeah, I can see why it's a classic. The next one I've picked is also um, a book written in German originally and that's The Artificial Silk Girl from um, 1932 by Ermgard Cohen. Um, I read the translation by Kathy von Ankum. Berlin in the late 20s, early 30s, um, you know, such an interesting time, such an interesting um, uh, atmosphere, uh, you know, all the that sort of risque kind of uh, culture going on and change, and yet the sort of looming um, development of, 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 of the Nazi party. I was so engaged by the, um, by the main character of that book. It, 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 it sucked me in and whisked me along. Um, the, my fifth sort of top classic um, was at the upper end of, of the period for me, if I say classics end in 1950, that's arbitrary, isn't it? It's a book from 1940. Um, it's an Italian book by Dino Buzzati. It's called The Tartar Step. I uh, It wasn't a book that I knew a lot about until um, relatively recently. It, it, I guess it's, 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 um, but it's definitely a classic of Italian sort of modernist literature. Um, what an odd book, but what an enjoyable one. It's it's set in a fortress in the mountains. Uh, nothing happens for ages and ages. And then a little tiny thing happens and then nothing happens again for ages and ages. It's about the futility of life and, and you know, um, and how we settle for things. And there's a sort of allegorical quality to it. It's a, it's a strong recommendation um, from me. So, backlist. Let's do backlist. Um, so we're talking 1950 to 2000. I'll do these in, again, similarly in the sort of oldest first and move forward, if that makes sense. So I will start with Mehmed My Hawk, Turkish novel by um, Yasha Kemal. Um, I read the translation by Edward Roditi. I read it with Berna, who's from Turkey. She read it in Turkish. I read it in English. Wow extraordinary book. I read the sequel as well a, a month or two later. They they burned thistles. It's it's set in the sort of early 20th century. It's at a time of great change in Turkey. The hero is a, um, a kind of 
ordinary village boy who becomes um, a folk hero in his own lifetime. Sort of a bandit, but a bit of a Robin Hood figure. Really, really enjoyable novel that also, I think, was probably speaking to current current affairs in 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 um in 1950s turkey at the same at the same time you know there's a political kind of quality i suppose to the to that and the sequel next up japanese novel from 1957 the waiting years by um fumiko enchi um translation by john bester i've talked about this in the video last week she's one of japan's sort of top 20th century women novelists it's historical fiction she's writing about the end of the 19th early 20th century it's feminist it's um really striking um novel that follows through um one woman's life and as a wife and her relationship with her husband's concubines that she has to kind of um, almost manage and support it appears a great change for Japanese women and uh, and she really nails it for me as a novel. Um, lovely, cool style. Next, a Welsh novel. Yeah, translated from the Welsh. One Moonlit Night, um, published originally in 1961 by Caradog Pritchard. Um, I read the translation by Philip Mitchell. Strange, strange book. You'll notice I like a strange book. It's set in a, 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 a small village or nearly town um, that's sort of um, in the, the Welsh mountains. It's a Welsh-speaking community. It's a kind of coming-of-age story. It's um, there's slightly uh, it, it's it's sort of the narrator is looking back at his childhood. Kind of things kind of come into um, come into focus and then fade out again and then come into focus in an episodic way. Um, I was besotted with that book, even though the and the end the ending is strange and confusing. Next, a book from Brazil. Another book from Brazil, because obviously the spectres from Brazil. The Women of Tijucapapo, um, by Ma oh now, what's her name? Malina Felinto. And originally published in 1982, I read the translation by Irene Matthews. This was the angriest book that I read all year. Um, and that's why I think it's stuck in my mind as, as, as um, one of my, yeah, my most memorable reads. Again, it's, I guess it's a... Um, a book about a woman's experience and it's kind of a feminist novel again I suppose it's uh, other books I've read from Brazil perhaps have a kind of more intellectual quality this is a much more visceral book I uh, and but like some other books I read this year it kind of visits male violence in a in um and the impact of that and how as a woman you can you you experience that or kind of find the resilience to um get beyond it now i realized that four of my top five backlist novels were works in translation so i thought let, let's actually pick an english one for for the fifth and uh, that's offshore by penelope fitzgerald published in 1979 it won the booker prize that year slightly surprisingly penelope fitzgerald is a superb stylist i think her writing is so focused so compact her description is so economical and yet on point um it's a story of a, a group of people living in houseboats on the river thames and they're a, a, a close-knit community but they it, that sort of falls apart because of various events um it's only short but it's it's rich beyond its length i really rate penelope fitzgerald yeah one of my favorite more modern yeah authors so let's get to recent fiction oh dear i'm not going to do this in under 30 minutes i can see but i'm still going to go for it so 
recent fiction in translation. Top five of those. Oh, now, uh, starting with the oldest, Brickmakers. Brickmakers by Selva Almada. Um, originally written in 2013, but the translation was more recent, um, which is why, you know, I, I came to read it. The translation is by Annie McDermott. It's from Argentina. It's another book that's really about male violence and macho culture and the impact of that on both men and women. It's in, it's short, it's intense, it is violent, but it's also it's quite subtle and moving. It has a slightly, it, it's, it's two young men um, who have basically mortally wounded each other in a fight. And it's almost looking back at their lives as they're kind of falling unconscious from, from, from blood loss. That sounds awful, doesn't it? I found it a beautiful book. Next, also from 2013, Season of the Shadow by Leonora Miano. Um, she's a writer from Cameroon. The translation was by Gila Walker. Really unusual, clever, cleverly structured, very stylized book, I suppose, about... Um, the early period of, of the slave trade but from the point of view of West African people and the, the, the kind of villages where the slaves were being captured from and taken to the, to the coast um, to be traded with Europeans. And there's a kind of slightly, I don't know, magical quality to it, you know, uh, um, to drawing on... on, on um, almost like kind of folk beliefs um, and um, uh, it's really fresh, really different and I found it entrancing and um, very powerful. What's next? 2016, 2016 Disoriental by um, Negar Javadi, Iranian um, uh, author now living in France. The translation is by the wonderful Tina Kova. It's a, a book about growing up in Iran and then the experience of um, exile in France. It's also a book about fertility. It's also a book about... Um, uh, sort of being lesbian when in a in a uh when you come from a culture that might not be comfortable with that um it's about family history and the legacy you get from your um grandparents and aunts and uncles and great uncles and how that kind of helps shape your character and um it was uh, not to everyone's taste i think but a definite win for me where have we got to? 2017. Minor Detail by Palestinian author um, uh, Ad Adiana Shibley and with the translation by Elizabeth, ja Elizabeth Jacket. Wow. This is a book I read early in the year that has stayed seared into my mind. It's set in two periods and it has two women protagonists. Um, one at sort of back in the 1940s um, and is a, a woman who is, um, without any spoilers, um, kind of damaged in an, uh, an, a kind of a, an atrocity by um, Israeli soldiers. And then a modern day Palestinian woman who make, who goes on a kind of like a journey or a road trip to try and find out more about what happened but can't really and it it's hard to explain how good this book is but it's a brilliant novel and finally the anomaly 2020 novel by um french author Hervé letelier um translated by adriana hunter one i read for the booktube prize and it ended up uh, uh as a, a you know a really worthy winner of that prize i thought i love this book it is just so it's so clever without being clever clever 
Uh, so an aeroplane goes into a, a cloud and emerges and lands and uh, what the passengers discover is that the same plane, the plane that they're in and with them in it, also landed three months earlier, that somehow they'd be doubled and they've appeared three months later. And the impact of that on, you know, all those people, those doubled people, that's hard to explain, isn't it? It uses different styles, it uses different voices, it it, it, it focuses on different characters and both both versions of those characters, the, you know, the 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 one that the ones that carried on with their lives and the ones that disappeared for three months. It's it's imaginative, stylish, and um, uh, exciting. There you go. And finally, my top five um, contemporary fiction in English. Where should we go with this? Well, so they're all from 2021 or 2022, so I won't bother saying. Uh, one Australian book, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Owl. What a subtle, thoughtful, um, unusual, um, short but deep book that is. It's about a, a mother and a daughter who meet, then go on a trip together in Japan. It's about their relationship. It's about, um, you know, that the, the that thing where as a mother and daughter... Um, you know, it's written from the point of view of the daughter and, and you're used to your mother looking after you and then you realise that the, the the balance has shifted and they now need you to to step up. Um, but you can't undo your whole history before that. Beautiful, beautiful. Lean Stand Fall by John McGregor. He, I think, would describe himself as a British author. He was born in Bermuda but grew up in Norfolk and, you know, his family were originally, you know, Scottish or Irish or something, Yeah. So, a shapeshifter of a novel, this one. Um, it starts out being a sort of, uh, almost like an adventure tale in, in the Arctic, or no, Antarctic, one or the other, I can't remember. Antarctic, Antarctic. And turns into a book about um, being a carer and what that does to you as a, as a wife if you're caring for your um, husband who's, you know, become disabled. And then about kind of recovery and, 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 and yeah, recovery from head injury and, and uh, that experience. Goodness me, what an interesting, what an interesting set of things to bring together in a book. It's quite an experimental writer, um, John McGregor, but I, I've loved every book. I think I've read everything he's ever written and I've loved every one. A book that lots of people didn't love, but I did, was Treacle Walker by Alan Garner. Um, he's definitely an English writer. He really draws on English folklore and um, builds that into this story. And he does that with all his books. It's um, not to everybody's taste. Um, it's written through the eyes of a child, which um, is sometimes a turn off, certainly for me and for lots of other authors, writers, uh, readers. But um, but it works. Um, it's short and odd and twisted and kind of dark and yet funny and unusual. There you go. An Irish author, Lynn Buckle, What Willow Says. Now, this was recommended by Irish author Ronan Hessian and I'm so glad I read it. It's it's a book about a deaf child who's been bereaved and her relationship with her grandmother. It's also a book about trees and nature and, yeah, folk tales come kind of come into it again. It's, it's and culture. It's um, short but rich and terribly, terribly sad. I have to warn you, it's, it's a book that you're, you're going to wind up with a tear in your eye. But don't make, don't, don't make that not, make you not read it. Do read it. It's brilliant. And finally... Last of my top five um, contemporary fiction, Companion Piece by Ali Smith, Scottish writer. Um, I don't need to tell you why Ali Smith is, is brilliant. I've loved her, everything she's ever written, but particularly her seasonal quartet. And then this sort of kind of rounds that up. And she is just writing about 
contemporary Britain, um, right bang up to the minute. And it's the only successful book I've read that kind of draws on the, so far, that draws on the COVID epidemic. There we go. I shall stop. Just under 40 minutes, I think. And um, I hope you enjoy it and that I haven't rambled on too much.